Hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Risk Management, Ensuring Food Safety with Quality Management Software, sponsored by Intellex. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief for Quality Digest, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Food safety and food quality have an integrated relationship. While food quality relates to ensuring that products meet the established, uh, established requirements for food characteristics, food safety relates to those characteristics that have the potential to be harmful to health. Food safety characteristics are, therefore, specific kinds of food quality characteristics. This connection means that companies in the food and beverage industry can use quality management tools to help them navigate the complex regulations and standards that govern the international supply chain, including food safety. Today, our presenters will discuss how an integrated software quality management system for food and beverage can help you ensure consistent quality management practices across facilities in different locations and ensure compliance with regulatory requirements in every jurisdiction. Before I introduce today's presenters, just a reminder that at any time you can send questions to us using the Q&A box. You can find the Q&A box in the lower right corner of your screen, or you might see a pull-down menu at the top of your screen. Click that. You will see a Q&A button that you can click to open up that Q&A box. Send your questions to us at any time. We'll get to them at the, uh, after the presentation. Uh, a recording of this webinar as well as a copy of the slides will be available one day after the webinar. Keep your eyes open for an email that we will send you uh, probably tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon. Okay, today's presenters are Nicole Radziwill, Vice President of Quality and Supply Chain Management at Intellex. She's also an ASQ Fellow and Editor of Software Quality Professional. Uh, we also have with us Sandrin uh, Fanaretta, Senior Product Marketing Manager and Quality Management, uh, I'm sorry, of Quality Management Software at Intellex Technologies, and also Angelica Loriano, a Food Safety Solutions Specialist at Intellex. Uh, okay, Nicole, I think you are first up. Thanks so much, Dirk. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar on approaches to ensuring food safety and how you can make it easier with quality management software. Whether you've been in the food and beverage industry for a while or you're just getting started, one of the first things you probably noticed was, and, and this pun is totally intended, the alphabet soup of, of standards and principles and guidance. So one of the things we're aiming to do over the next hour is to untangle that a bit and then show you how and where different kinds of software systems can help. Um, and, and along the way, we're, we want to help you understand what blockchain is. This, this emerging technology is the foundation for exciting things like Bitcoin, which I know you've heard of. Although when you use it for supply chain applications, it works a little bit differently than with Bitcoin. But by the time this webinar is done, you should be able to explain what blockchain is and why it's becoming so relevant to food safety management. If you've attended any one of my previous webinars, you know that I've been working with big data and emerging technologies since late 90s. So I'm always looking towards the future. And in particular, the question that I want to answer is what can we do now so that we're positioned to capture those breakthrough opportunities later? And so that's why I want to start out by sharing this project with you. Uh, this is uh, some of my colleagues in tech because this is the future that we need to prepare ourselves for. And so with that, I am going to get a video for you. We have a very complex supply chain. One of my biggest fears is that I have all of the information I need to prevent an outbreak and I can't see it because of all the noise, because everything is on paper and I can't connect the dots. What we as an industry need to do is provide that end-to-end -end visibility so that as issues arise, we can depend on each other to deliver information quickly that we can then act on. If you're trying to chase trends, if you're trying to keep up with scarcity, if you're trying to respond to an abundance, taking any time at all to respond means you're already several steps behind. IBM Food Trust is a blockchain system that consists of digitizing information about our food supply chain in a way that's indelible, in a way that is searchable, so that we can have instant access to records that we can have faith in. I believe that the benefits for food safety are just the tip of the iceberg. One third of all food that gets produced is wasted. IBM Food Trust could allow you to optimize supply chain efficiencies, take out days of shelf life, reducing food waste both in store and at home. You're stitching together a transaction flow 
that by itself is important, but then you add all of these other data from IoT devices and stitch it into the same record. Now you have higher quality, higher visibility to your supply chain and digital records confirming that that should be trusted. Providing safe and affordable food is not only a daunting challenge, but for us, it's an important responsibility. We can trace origin of food products back to source in 2.2 seconds. That's food traceability at the speed of thought. We're expecting improved transparency, improved trust, and improved speed. All those are possible with IBM Food Trust and with blockchain, and I hope for more adoption across the food ecosystem. So I wanted to emphasize what Natalie Dyerson said in the beginning. Um, she, she said that her fear was, I have all the information I need to prevent an outbreak, but I can't see it because of all the noise because everything is on paper and I can't connect the dots. And it's really exciting to me that her company is part of the IBM Food Trust and is using these new technologies to achieve traceability on the orders of seconds. But what was left out, what was kind of assumed in this short video was that you have to have a solid foundation in place. You already have to be collecting your own data. You need a holistic and an integrated food safety and quality management system that enables you to take advantage of these new and exciting technologies. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. This is becoming more important now than ever, uh, in part due to the Food Safety Modernization Act that was signed by uh, Obama into law in 2011. It's been gradually implemented ever since. We're, we're only about 60% of the way through the process, in fact. Um, FISMA establishes a really broad vision. It's one that has safety, quality, and sustainability as drivers. FISMA wants us to think about the interrelationships between things, between things like risk management, decision making, the environment, uh, all of these things in addition to safety and quality because everything is connected. We can't disconnect these things. So even if you're not in the U.S. and you're not regulated by FISMA, this law really is bringing about uh, a sea change and raising the bar for what can and should be done in operations around the world. So as a result, today, here's what we're gonna cover. Um, first of all, we'll pull apart the alphabet soup, hopefully give you a frame of reference to understand how all these regulations and guidelines fit together. Second, we're gonna talk about the role of a quality management system in your organization, touch on the importance of the, the CAPA process, corrective actions. And then um, we're gonna talk about communication, uh, why communication is important and how systems facilitate that. Finally, we're gonna give you a, a blockchain 101, and then we're gonna end up with insights and advice for how you can move forward. So the first of our five topics is gonna to be food safety and quality. But we just wanna give you some basic concepts to frame the rest of what we're gonna be covering in this webinar. So in the context of this industry, food quality means adherence to requirements, um, making sure the production process consistently yields food products that have the right taste and the right texture, uh, maybe even the right temperature. And as, as Dirk mentioned earlier, food safety characteristics are a subset of food quality characteristics, but granted, uh, they are the most important quality characteristics because if your product sickens or kills people, or even if it gradually and over time poisons people, like what happened uh, with the lead oxide added to turmeric and curry powder several years ago, and that's gonna have an impact on sales and reputation. Whether that impact is immediate or long-term is gonna depend on the particular case. And large-scale public health issues can have far-reaching consequences. They can have impacts that span years because people remember. Uh, but because classical quality methods have tended to focus only on the characteristics of the final product, there's really a need to design quality in to the facility and the production process. And that's what food safety and quality management is all about because consumer protection and brand protection are the key issues. And the, the systems, the processes we put in place, they should ideally cover all the cases we have to protect against. So in addition to food quality and food safety, we have to think about food fraud. These are usually economically motivated cases where substitutions or fillers are used in products instead of the ingredients that are specified on the label. Um, the reason why organizations do this is that it can keep costs down or it can enhance the consumer's perception of quality. And then the final category is food defense. 
So that's where a part of the food supply is intentionally sabotaged or poisoned or, or maybe even mislabeled so that people aren't on the alert for things like potential allergic reactions because, you know, those can be life-threatening. Bottom line is that uh, producers have to be on the alert for any of these things because they can impact consumers as well as the brand. So the idea is um, food safety management systems and quality management systems, they, they together provide this hybrid capability and, and strengthened by these new requirements of, of FISMA. Um, I say that these requirements are new because the impacts are really going to resonate for the next couple of decades. We're, we're only at the beginning of technology-enabled food protection. Um, one of the reasons why this is the case, uh, as George Hallett pointed out in the article that this diagram came from, is that even though FISMA only impacts the, the United States, it's turning the regulatory influence on its head uh, by imposing a, a stricter compliance burden uh, than what's in GFSI recognized schemes. Um, it, it's, it's forcing everyone to kind of step up their game. And like I mentioned earlier, we're, we're only at the beginning of the FISMA driven transformation. Um, this chart of compliance states, it comes from LSU. Uh, you can get it either from the URL at the top right hand corner of your screen or by searching for LSU and FISMA compliance states. Um, 2019 is the column right in the middle there. Um, preventive controls for human foods, uh, that specifies in detail how to implement FISMA. Uh, that's already completely in play, um, but there's a couple other things that are, are still midway through. Produce safety regulation has yet to be required by large farms and very small farms. And foreign supplier verification program, that's only started rolling out. So the, the rest of this presentation is going to assume that your baseline is FISMA, but the insights are going to apply to any organization that's managing to GFSI recognized schemes. The part to remember here is that you can't address quality and food safety independently, particularly now. And because keeping the workers healthy and safe is also going to serve to mitigate the risk of, of hazards and contaminants, it really makes sense to treat it all as one complex and dynamic and integrated system. So now the fun part is going to be the acronyms part. Uh, the first acronym I want to talk about is GFSI, that's Global Food Safety Initiative. This is a benchmarking organization. They're based in Belgium. It's predominantly driven by volunteers. It has a, a mission of collaborating. They want to continuously improve the practice of food safety as a professional community. So at the time G GFSI was founded in 2000, uh, the different food safety standards, they were being developed pretty much in isolation. They were, they were different from one another. Uh, BRC was, was in place in the UK. IFS was just starting to come to, to play in France and Germany and SQF in North America. So if you had an international organization, it was difficult to manage compliance to all the different standards. So GFSI, what they wanted to do is devise a method where you could certify once with them and then you'd be recognized every, anywhere, everywhere. Um, so that's, that's, what they've, uh, that's what they've been able to do. So the chart at the URL uh, in yellow, what's typed in yellow, uh, that chart, uh, if you go get it, can help you pick out based on your type of business which of the GFSI recognized schemes are right for you. So this, this is actually my, my favorite diagram here. Um, the idea with the GFSI recognized schemes for becoming certified is that they're all squarely based on a shared foundation, a shared solid foundation, and that is understanding and dealing with hazards and putting in place good manufacturing practices, or GMPs, uh, which ensure that the buildings you work in and the environment you set up aren't going to the, themselves become hazardous to the food production process. So once you have that solid foundation in place, then you have to attend to the regional and national laws that are going to govern your jurisdiction. They're, they're going to assume, all those laws are going to assume that you already have that solid foundation and that you have the ability to identify what hazards could impact your business in your area. On top of that, is going to be ISO 22000. So ISO 22000 is an international standard that kind of wraps up four different components. Um, it, it also provides some guidance on how to do them. And those four components are hazard analysis, uh, your good manufacturing practices, communication, and PRPs, or prerequisite programs. Um, GMPs themselves are prerequisites, and you may also choose to implement more prerequisites beyond those GMPs. Uh, the FDA, they have a list of PRPs that you can select from, um, or you can also use the ones that are in ISO 
22,002. There's like seven different ones there, uh, and they govern different types of business. So, for example, um, packaging companies are, are one of those pieces of guidance. Uh, catering companies are another. And so you go in there and you choose which ones apply to your organization. So I said 22,000 provides some clarity about exactly how to do that bottom layer and how to implement it in practice. But uh, unfortunately, organizations found that ISO 22000 was a, a little bit too generic. And, and so as a result, GFSI doesn't recognize it. That's where FFSC 22000 comes in. So it, the FFSSC 22000 builds on the guidance provided by ISO 22000. But in addition, um, it, it adds some rigor for food processors and caterers agricultural organizations, companies that do packaging. Um, if you're already certified to ISO 22000, taking the, the extra steps to become FFSC 22000 certified, um, first of all, should be straightforward, and second of all, it will get you recognized by GFSI. So SQF, BRC, and IFS, they also go those additional steps. They add rigor so that you can align with internationally recognized best practices but the scope of each of them is slightly different. So uh, IFS, for example, it combines quality, environmental management, and social responsibility. It's the only one that, that brings together all of those. Um, and the SQF and BRC are, are a little bit different. They don't have those environmental management or social responsibility components. So finally, at the very top of the pyramid, um, we have best practices, emerging best practices, um, things that will uniquely contribute to competitive advantage. So these can be things like um, if you're using new scientific methods for detecting allergens or contaminants, or uh, for example, new mechanisms for fast traceability like blockchain. So th this is how all of, these, uh, all of these things kind of fit together and relate to one another in your organization. At this point, it might be useful uh, to recall the roles of quality and EHS. So, well, EHS is in place in an organization to keep the workers healthy and safe. Uh, and, and, you know, you don't want them to, to do things or to bring health hazards into the organization. You don't want them to contaminate the food or have accidents that could similarly taint the food. Uh, and you also want to monitor environmental impact. So the quality function, in contrast, is going to be responsible for the safety of the product itself. So EHS, safety of the worker and the environment, quality safety of the product. So that's the distinction that we need to keep in mind. So if we break it down a little bit more, uh, in, in addition to everything on that pyramid from the previous slide, you can also have an independent quality system in place like ISO 9000 to help you meet all of your product requirements consistently. So not just the safety requirements, but also taste, texture, and other things. Um, it's not uncommon to see food manufacturers who are both ISO 9001 certified and certified to a GFSI recognized scheme. And because the scope of your quality systems and your food safety management systems is slightly different, um, together, bringing them together, the, the functionalities ensure that your food safety characteristics are going to be met within the context of, of the, the quality of your entire product. So while food safety tasks and food safety activities are going to focus on prerequisite programs and GMPs like like sanitation and pest control uh, and hazard analysis, and also monitoring those control points on a regular basis, the quality function is going to bring in voice of the customer, continuous improvement, um, data-driven decision-making, things like managing your supplier relationships, and, and those are in blue. The food safety practices in green, they're there to make sure you do the thing right. But the quality practices, those ones in blue, they're there to make sure that you do the right thing. So hopefully what you can see is that there's a, a very synergistic relationship between quality management and food safety management. Um, just recently, we've had a major update to ISO 9001 um, in the 2018 revision. Risk-based thinking is a focal element. We've done some earlier webinars on that. Uh, we noted earlier, too, that risk-based thinking is a cornerstone of FISMA. So as technological capabilities increase, it's, it's no surprise that many of these standards are co-evolving and that more of them are incorporating systems thinking. So by taking this approach, we can have a, a direct impact on the business bottom line, and we can leverage both our quality and food safety processes to reduce losses and speed decision making and uh, ultimately improve better 
and more quickly. So the cornerstone of the um, PCHF guidance that's, that's come out from CISMA is the food safety plan. Every organization is required to document the procedures they use to ensure food safety, um, and, and that includes each of these seven areas. So number one, you need a hazard analysis. Uh, that's where you start. Um, number two, you need to document all of your preventive controls. So the term preventive controls uh, is now the combined total uh, of what used to be critical control points, the control points inside your process, and controls for sanitation and allergens. That those would previously be considered the PRPs, the prerequisite programs. Uh, next, you need to document controls you have on suppliers um, so you can explain how you're monitoring the quality and the, the safety of incoming ingredients. You need to have plans in place that describe thresholds for decision making. Uh, you know, how are you going to know when it's time to initiate a recall and, and how are, what communication plans are you going to have in place when that happens? You also need monitoring procedures, uh, checks, so processes to prove that you're using the control points that, that you decided upon. You also need, and this is kind of unique, you need corrective action procedures. So when you deviate from your nominal processes or your nominal conditions, how, how do you recover? You know, you don't want to think about it in the moment. You, you want to have a plan in place so you can just follow it when that happens. Finally, you want to make sure you have verification procedures. So a science-based defensible protocol uh, for how you know that your preventive controls and your monitoring and your corrective actions are working. Um, another thing to, to keep in mind is uh, human factors play a role in each one of these elements. And so uh, there's, there's some guidance on the slide that uh, shows you some things that you should think about. The core of the food safety plan, um, even though the concept of food safety plan is new, the core is still hazard analysis. So HACCP, uh, hazard analysis and critical control points, uh, this has been the operative method for decades for hazard analysis. And uh, as a result of uh, 21 CFR 117, um, HACCP has gotten a facelift to HARP C. And, and here's the difference. HACCP focuses entirely on the process controls. So uh, when you have your hazard analysis in place, it assumes that prerequisite programs and GM GMPs are already in place, they're already working, everything is good, and, and there's no reason to go back and check. HARP-C, on the other hand, doesn't make that assumption. So um, HARP-C requires that you take a, a holistic look at your sanitation controls, allergen controls, labeling practices, um, supply chain controls, all of those things in addition to your process controls, and for good reason, too. So, you know, particularly if a process runs for months or years without a change, um, who's to say that the environment it's running in is going to stay exactly the same? I mean, it, it seems like a risk to make that assumption. Uh, the FDA thought so, too. So now no assumptions are being made in the hazard analysis about your GMPs and your prerequisite programs. Everything is up for continuous review, and that's the difference. So, uh, so once again, HACCP is the international standard. It's part of ISO 22000. And HARP-C is kind of the upgrade, the FISMA version um, that combines HACCP plus GMPs plus prerequisite programs, PRPs, and operational PRPs. And it does that in the form of different kinds of controls, different classes of controls. Also important, uh, HACCP requires that you address biological chemical and physical hazards, and HARP-C adds a couple categories. Uh, you also have to consider, you have to, to acknowledge that you're considering radiological hazards and economically motivated hazards, and, and those are the ones that are central to food fraud. So control points and everything else are considered preventive controls, PCs in HARP-C. So when you look at, this is an example of a hazard analysis, and, and, and when you look in, inside, you can see the distinction between these, these different um, preventive controls. So this comes from an ice cream manufacturer in Algeria. The yellow lightning bolts at the top, um, that shows that there's gaps in the process steps between number one, which is reception, uh, or bringing the ingredients into the, the prep area, and then the second step you see up there is pasteurization. Clearly, there's a lot of stuff that happens between the ingredients coming in and pasteurization, but that's why the lighting bill is there. So from that point on, the process goes through cooling, flavoring, um, all the way down to storage and transport. So 
for each process step, for each row, we have to identify which biological, chemical, and physical hazards are reasonably likely to occur. So we don't have to cover all of them, just the ones that are reasonably likely to occur. And we would also want to consider radiological and economically motivated hazards. One of the things I like about this particular example of the hazard analysis is the causes columns about midway through. Um, where we can track whether that hazard is associated with materials or methods or machines. Um, the reason why I like this column is because then we can create an Ishikawa diagram, a fishbone diagram, to explore root causes if we need to. So it's a good thing to add to your hazard analysis. Associated with each of these hazards is going to be a preventive measure, and that preventive measure is going to be some kind of critical control point or a measurable, verifiable prerequisite program step that you can track and prove that you did it. The decision tree column, that's just to the left of preventive measures, that shows it's a process for distinguishing between control points and PRPs, prerequisite programs, and operational PRPs. And in HARP-C, of course, all of those are preventive controls. And the methods associated with this distinction are, these, here's actually two methods. Um, the one on the left comes from a research study, and the one on the right comes from a practitioner. Uh, I'm not going to go through these decision trees in detail. You'll be getting the, the slides in the next day or so, so you can explore it yourself. But I do want to point out that the questions here are pretty straightforward, starting at the top left. Is there a significant hazard in this process step? Do control measures exist for it? And so on. These are very practical questions. So if the hazard is minor, or if it has a, a low potential to occur, or, or, you know, alternatively, if there's no way at all to detect the hazard, there's no sense putting it in your, your hazard plan to go into operations. So throughout all of this, the, the production process is the centerpiece. Um, your control points or your preventive controls are matched up against those process steps. And the data you collect to ensure traceability is also going to be matched up to those process steps. So um, note here that the, the process only includes steps you're in control of. It doesn't cover the whole supply chain from the original source to the customer. But uh, there may be solutions for that emerging through um, services like the blockchain-based IBM Food Trust. One thing that I'd also like to bring up briefly, uh, and this is something that's been mentioned in research papers sporadically for like 20 years, uh, is to also use FMEA, failure mode effects analysis, in addition to HACCP or HARP-C for hazard analysis. It hasn't been broadly adopted, but the tool may have the potential to do things like surface preventive controls that may otherwise not be identified. Um, for example, if you look in the rightmost column, you see HACCP control visual inspection by group lead. But, you know, that, that doesn't look like a critical control point. A critical control point would be something like cook to 160 degrees for 60 seconds. So this, this control point that FMEA uncovered is actually more in line with a HARP-C preventive control um, because you could imagine that it's, it's a pass-fail step that occurs somewhere in the, the production process that you can actually um, have a, a process step in place where that visual inspection takes place and you can record uh, whether it was passed. So moral of the story here is if you are in the process of transitioning from HACCP to HARP-C, uh, you might want to consider introducing FMEA because this might strengthen your ability to identify a different type of preventive controls, one that you're not used to keeping track of. So. There's a lot of information to keep track of. Um, even before certification audits demand that you, you bring all the information together to communicate to a third party, you know, there's your process steps, your hazards, the preventive controls, all of these things have to be in place before your process begins. Uh, then you need to keep track of what steps are part of the production process and, and keep records. And when things change, when you make an improvement to a process, you need to make sure that people are not only notified, but, uh, you know, trained on it immediately. And this is why quality systems, quality management systems can be valuable. Um, your QMS can organize your life, your work life at least. It can make communicating about it a lot easier. And why is this important? Because communication is at the root 
of harm reduction. Uh, and harm reduction is one of the essential counter methods for the, the food protection risk matrix that I showed you in the very beginning. A QMS essentially does two things. Um, first of all, it keeps track of quality events. Those are the things like non-conforming incoming product or non-conforming outgoing product. Of course, you know, it's not going to get out the door. Um, customer complaints, even incidents that threaten health or food safety. Um, if, if these events are significant, uh, you may want to launch a corrective action to implement a more long-term and systematic fix. The second element of quality management systems are quality controls. The measures that you put in place to keep the process on track, to keep the foundations for your process solid and secure. And like we said before, there's lots to keep track of and your auditors and, and your suppliers too, your customers too, if they're, they're auditing you, they're gonna want to know about all of it. The central element of any quality management system though is gonna be the corrective action object because th this is the mechanism by which you update the quality controls to prevent quality events from happening. So corrective action object, that's how you keep track of the quality controls and how they change to minimize quality events. And, and it's a constant cycle. So the system is, is always adjusting and improving. People are always learning as they gain new skills and as science gains new methods and you bring them into your operations. And you know, people tend to think about corrective actions as, as things that went wrong and how we fix them. But really, it's one of the best tracers for organizational learning that, that's out there. And I like to refer to one of my favorite research papers from 2013 uh, by Jamie Kovac and Larry Fredendahl. They figured out that it's not your continuous improvement program that leads to business results. It's the learning that comes from your continuous improvement program. So learning requires communication, and that communication is supported by the quality management systems that can keep track of it. When you look at the roles and responsibilities of food safety managers, communication is always going to be front and center. So at least half of these elements on your screen right now require sharing and educating. Uh, I want to highlight the role of corrective actions at the bottom, because the food safety manager has to use the information in those corrective actions or CAPAs to guarantee that the problem is not repeated in the future. That's the mechanism by which they accomplish that goal. Management reviews, they're also an important part of management systems, a uh, key factor in ISO 9001 and ISO 22000 based systems. So a good quality management system can also be helpful for organizing your management reviews. Uh, if you look at all the inputs there on the left-hand side, it can be a huge challenge to get ready for a management review when you have to pull artifacts from a whole bunch of file cabinets. It's a lot easier if you can just go to a website and everything is in there and then you can focus on the outputs and how you use them, what needs to be improved, you know, how, how does resourcing need to change so that we can make these improvements. And most importantly, being able to, to communicate readily about all these quality events and quality controls and how you've improved can also help you respond to risks more quickly and more fully. Um, remember the video at the beginning? One of the guys in there said, uh, if it takes any time at all to respond uh, to a serious quality event, you're probably already behind. And software systems can help you shorten that response time. And of course, that's, ex that, that's precisely what's so exciting about, about blockchain. I mean, it's, it's the promise of being able to identify the source of a problem, to trace it, no matter where in the supply chain it occurs, in seconds, being able to get that near instantaneous traceability. And there's a lot of reasons why organizations want traceability. Um, Maybe they're required to have by law, or maybe they need to be able to get to root causes more easily. For other organizations, traceability is the key to continuously improving the global supply chain. And you know, that's potentially something that could generate massive financial savings. So lots of motivation there. The tech solution that's being proposed for traceability, like we mentioned earlier, is blockchain. In the next few minutes, I'm gonna explain that to you in really simple terms. So blockchain depends on hashing. Hashing is a, a cryptographic mathematical process, and it turns an object into a sequence of unique numbers and letters. That, that's all hashing is. So in fact, most of the systems you use today, um, they'll hash your password and they'll, they'll store this weird sequence of, of letters and numbers that you see in these three examples down there on the bottom, rather than your real password. So when you log into a system, they hash the password that you've just entered, 
and they compare that hash to the hash of your real password, which they have stored in their system. And if the two hashes match, you're going to get to log in. But this is why so many systems require that you reset your password if you forget it. It's not that they won't give your password to you. It's that they don't actually know what it is. They, they only know the hash. And you can't unhash something to get the original. That's, that's part of um, why cryptography is, is so useful. So you can go one way, you can hash something, but you can't unhash something. Uh, there's lots of different hashing algorithms. Uh, each of them produces different lengths of sequences. So in those three examples at the bottom, I hashed a passphrase, and the passphrase was, here is my password. Uh, the first one uses the hashing algorithm CRC32. Second one uses Murmur32, and the third one uses MD5. And what you'll notice is that the MD5 algorithm, uh, that, that generates a much longer sequence of letters and numbers. So um, because it's a longer sequence, there's more possibilities, and there's less of a chance that if you hash two different objects, the same output will come out. So that's called collision avoidance. And so that's why you usually use hashing algorithms that generate those long strings. You can hash pretty much anything. So uh, we're going to hash my cat. This is my cat. Uh, we're actually, we're not going to hash my, my actual cat. We're going to hash the picture of my cat. So uh, in order to do that, all you have to do is load in an image file. And then I use the, the digest command, which is a, a, which is a hashing algorithm. Uh, and I told the digest command that I wanted to hash my cat using SHA-256. So SHA-256 is the most common hashing algorithm because it's got great collision avoidance. So what you see is that I've just turned my cat into a sequence of numbers and letters, starting with DCD239. And here's where it gets fun. One of these four pictures is different than the others. Can you look around and see if you can tell which one it is? One of them is definitely different. So if you were all here in, a, in a, an in-person audience, I would ask if you could find, you know, which is the different picture and how do you know? I've done this in, in large audiences before, uh, and nobody's been able to do it. But one of these pictures has a single pixel that's not in any of the other three pictures. Single pixel. But we can hash all four of these pictures, and what happens? All of a sudden, it's kind of obvious which picture is the different picture. It's, it's number three because you'll see that the hashes for 1, 2, and 4, they all start with DCD239. But the hash for 3, that's entirely different. So, you know, a tiny little change in the object, tiny little change in the object yields a huge change in the hash. And that is the method, that, that's the, the message of blockchain. Tiny changes in data, changes that would be undetectable to even the most careful human, they're going to generate giant changes in a hash, changes that are really easy to see. And those changes are going to, if you, if you arrange your transactions into a blockchain, the changes are going to break the blockchain and they're going to alert us that tampering has occurred. More specifically, the blockchain, it keeps track of a sequence or a chain of transactions. So maybe, maybe and this is a, a kind of a bizarre example, but maybe I'm shipping my cat. Maybe my cat is part of a supply chain, and I want to have a solid record of where she's been and her body temperature and the cabin temperature, anything that might help me monitor the conditions of my cat as she was transported from point A to point B. And so all of this data, and maybe even a picture of her that's geotagged, they all get bundled up into a transaction. And all of the information in the transaction creates a new block. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the hash code of the previous block, so the last time we checked on my cat and took a picture and, and measured her temperature and the temperature of her cabin. We're going to take the hash of the previous block, bundle that with the data that we're measuring now, and then we're going to hash the whole thing together. And that's what creates a chain of blocks. So the new hash is going to contain an image, a record of all of the other hashes before it. So you can imagine if any little piece of information changes or if the sequencing of the blocks change, there's going to be, you know, the, the problem is going to amplify it. So a tiny, tiny issue in the data is going to be amplified so we catch it immediately. So the blockchain, 
uh, it's that's why they call it an immutable peer-to-peer -peer transaction record um, because if it does change, it gets very loud. Uh, it, so if anybody tries to tamper with the data inside a blockchain or, or with the order of transactions or with the timestamps in the transactions, um, the, the system is going to notify you that, that that tampering has happened. And that's why blockchain is important. It's transparent. Everyone who's in the network can see the records. What that also means is, is that a blockchain is instantly auditable. So, in fact, since uh, smart contracts, which are one of the, the, the bases for, for blockchain, um, since they evaluate the data before it can be committed, theoretically, bad data shouldn't even be able to get into the blockchain. So, you know, imagine all those records that you keep throughout the supply chain. Imagine if it was instantly auditable and you knew the data in it was number one, good data, and number two, hadn't been tampered with or, or adjusted by anyone um, who, was, who was trying to, to cover up for something. You'd be able to, to make decisions based on much better information. So the, the IBM Food Trust that you were introduced to in the opening video, that's built on the Hyperledger blockchain. And although there are different blockchain implementations, um, personally, I'm putting all my eggs in that basket for two reasons. First of all, I know the people who are in charge of it and they have an amazing track record. And second, and more importantly, Hyperledger is the only blockchain project that's been driven by actual right now business needs of more than 100 organizations who are becoming the early adopters. And uh, although, we're, although we're only seeing blockchain, Hyperledger in particular, uh, in supply chain applications right now, um, I'm really looking forward to the instantaneously auditable quality management and food safety management systems of the future. Um, I gave a talk about this as a, at an auditor's conference last year. They weren't, they weren't that excited. They were actually kind of nervous about it. Because all of this, the, the risk-based management, the incorporation of new science into monitoring, controlling, and the transparency and traceability that can be brought about by blockchain, all of it is about how you turn your data into strategic advantage, pretty simple. So what does this mean to you? Let's take a look. So there's still plenty of organizations running manual processes. Um, maybe, maybe your processes are on paper, uh, or maybe some of it or most of it is on paper, you're just getting started. But as you advance in maturity, usually you're going to adopt spreadsheets or some other repeatable process with standard forms that you can use to capture your process data and your records from your GMPs and, and prerequisite programs. At the top end of maturity are organizations that have web-based, cloud-based systems already. They don't have to worry about adding new sites or facilities. They don't have to worry about scalability because their, their SaaS provider is going to take care of that for them. Moving from left to right, there's also a degree of process and systems maturity to think about. So uh, are you just kind of winging it, or do you have some controls in place to manage food safety already? Moving further to the right, um, do you have a management approach um, like SQF Level 2 to make sure your processes are consistent no matter which people are, are at your facility working? Uh, and then finally, at the highest maturity level all the way to the right, you have foundations in place for both food safety and quality, and you are continually and deliberately improving it. So check out this grid right here. Um, see if you can determine where you fit because here are all the components that you need to be thinking about. Um, these components are, although based on, on FISMA, they're general enough that they should be significant in any of the GFSI recognized schemes. But this diagram pertains specifically to um, the FISMA harp -C world, um, where your GMPs and your prerequisites and process controls have already been synthesized into one view. So what you want to ask yourself is, do you have any gaps here? Um, ideally, your quality management and, and food safety management approaches are going to be harmonized. And, and as a goal for your organization, think about how you might bring together not just your quality management and your food safety management, but also environment, occupational health and safety, uh, and those considerations to your quality and food safety management. The benefit in pulling them all together is because when you can look at all of that data in one place, you'll get to catch relationships and correlations between values that you might not ordinarily notice. And those are the kinds of things that will, number one, help you find opportunities for, for significant risk reduction and also 
um, finding cost efficiencies in improving your process and, and you know, also finding uh, improvements that uh, improve enhanced safety. So on a task level, here are all the things that you have to manage. Um, you're going to have to, number one, keep track of your documents. Make sure you know uh, what your most up-to-date documents are and make sure people are trained immediately on any process changes. No sense in uh, finding a great risk reduction or, or, or cost improvement in the process and then nobody does it. Uh, number two, you need an easy way to keep track of your internal audits, um, whether they're being done by your customers or third parties. And you need to make sure you're ready uh, to, to talk about your preventive controls. So you need to keep records of your preventive controls, your corrective action procedures, um, if you detect a nonconformance in your process. You also need to keep track of customer complaints. This is particularly important in the food industry because customer complaints are often the first indication of a larger scale health problem. And you know, if you have multiple customer complaints that relate back to the same food product, you want to you wanna know that there's a pattern being detected there. Finally, you need a way to manage corrective actions, whether they're for customers or they're for you internally, or maybe they're actions that, that you need to, to assign to your suppliers to do to improve your, the, the incoming quality of your, your ingredients. And you have to keep track of any changes and how your system of systems evolves, um, management of change. Um, you need to make sure that, that all of your people have immediate access to all these types of information to do their jobs well. So if you're looking out over a 10-year time horizon, um, here are the things you need to think about. Number one, get computerized and connected uh, so that nobody has to hunt for information, so that as things are updated, you, you know immediately, and so that you can find relationships between the, the, the elements of your system, between the quality events and the quality controls when you need to. Um, that's what you can do with a, a quality management system that can handle food safety. The next step, next evolutionary step, is to work on visibility and transparency throughout your supply chain. This is the problem that IBM Food Trust is working on right now, but it's one that you can't leverage until your systems are online and harmonized. And then, predictive capabilities and adaptive learning. We're just getting to those. They're certainly not mainstream yet, but when you need to start thinking about them, we'll definitely be doing another webinar for you, so keep your eyes out for that. Um, so that brings us to the end of, of my section. Thank you for your attention, and I am going to hand it over to Sondran now. And thanks. And before uh, before we uh, hear from Sondran, um, just a reminder, all of you out there, uh, now is the time to start sending your questions in for anything that uh, Nicole has already talked about. Uh, and obviously, if if Sandrin or, or Angelica say something, uh, you have questions, send those to us. Use the Q&A box in the lower right corner of your screen. Um, or you might see a drop down at the top, click that. You'll see the Q&A button, click that. Open up your Q&A box and send us questions. And we'll get to them uh, in just a few minutes here. Uh, go ahead, Sandrin. Thank you. Um, Nicole, that was a great presentation. Um, it really brings you into the fact and thinking about um, what's going on in the future, especially with food safety and quality management software. So again, let me introduce myself. I'm Sandra Infanaretta. I'm the Senior Product Marketing Manager at Intellex, um, specifically for quality and supplier management. Um, and Sandra, and we're, seeing your, uh, we're seeing your presenter view. Yeah, there we yes. go. Yes, there we go. There we go, perfect. Perfect. So what I do want to give a little bit of an overview is on Intellex. Um, so we are the leader in EHSQ software. Um, so many organizations are beginning an EHSQ journey um, with the objective of compliance initially in mind. Um, they're looking for either speaking to some of those compliance requirements that Nicole was speaking about, uh, ISO 22000, and trying to understand between this alphabet soup of compliance how to navigate that and what kind of system they can have in place to go ahead and ensure that they have the things that are required to be up to um, consideration and compliance. Um, so right now, Intellex actually, um, we were founded in 1992. We have over 400 individuals in employed. Um, we have 1.6 million users across 1,300 clients globally. And these are some of the biggest food and beverage organizations in the world that are leveraging our software to ensure food safety within their organizations. And I'm really actually happy to announce too as well is that um, Verdantix, the analysts in the 
um, in the industry has rated Intellex as the leader in EHSQ um, solutions. Um, and this is really important because of a lot of those things that we talk about with integrated management systems, there are so many harmonies between not just quality, but your health and safety programs and your environment programs where you can leverage all that data together and get more actionable insights within your organization. Um, so th that's really actually what is important for us at Intellex is ensuring that we'd have that integrated management system within your organization so you could get that insight um, that you're looking for. And specifically with food and beverage organizations, um, we, we understand the challenges that you're currently facing in place. Your data is siloed and inefficient. Um, you're not able to make those informed decisions using insights. Um, the other piece is with the compliance and with the standards, understanding, you know, is it ISO 22000 or what other standards specifically with FISMA do I need to comply with and what does that look like? Um, another big piece is the reduced productivity. Um, speaking to so many of our current customers, um, previously they were on pen and paper processes and there was a lack of understanding of the data, um, having disparate systems all over the place and it was always a pain or a problem for them to actually identify you know, what is going on within their supply chain, what is going on within their organization in terms of their culture of quality even. And that's the other thing is that building that culture of quality within an organization is super important. And having a software solution is an incredible incredible tool to go ahead and help build that culture within your organization and within your supply chain. Um, so Intellect specifically, we're, we're built on this platform and this platform is what makes us the most powerful EHSQ platform in the market and vendor is that this pl platform not only ties into a lot of the different standards that um, Angelica will be talking about in a little bit, but it really helps us provide this type of foundation for our customers to go ahead and be able to comply, be able to gain those insights quickly and effectively um, with the Intellects platform. So I do want to talk about some specific things that, um, that I'm really happy to talk about as well is the, the reporting, the mobile, and the cloud solution. So reporting is super important when you're looking at within your organization to understand um, what are the key metrics that you're wanting to uh, leverage. Um, and our system is actually able to customize our reports so every organization, depending on your workflows and processes, you have the data that you want available to your organization and to your managers. Um, mobile is one piece that we're focused on specifically and in terms of engagement. So we talked about the culture of quality and how that's very important. And one piece that we're really leveraging, including mobile, is the fact that a lot of our applications, you can leverage a nonconformance or an audit or a corrective actions through your mobile application. So in the case where it's allowable and every organization is different, you can engage your frontline workers to go ahead and involve themselves into the quality management program in your organization. And of course, power of cloud. So we are a cloud-based EHSQ solution. Um, so our quick implementation times and cost savings is super important. Um, Verdantix, in their latest green quadrant, which ranked Intellex um, the leader in EHSQ, um, specifically talks about our 180-day deployment time. Um, so this is extremely important for organizations when you're looking for that quick time to value on the implementation of a software, that you're getting that right away and you're not going through an extended implementation. Um, and one thing that, another thing that we've also talked about is, especially when we've surveyed our customers and tried to understand what they're looking for in a software solution and what actual leading companies and organizations are doing, is that they need to make sure not only if they're investing in software to help drive their compliance or reduce the inefficiencies that are within their programs right now, but they need to have this also aligned with their corporate strategy. It needs to have a change within their ecosystem processes and supply chains so they can actually go ahead and be successful with the solution. Um, we, we've talked to so many um, prospects and customers and it's they go ahead and implement a solution and there's not that follow through. There's not that follow through with either with implementation or there's not the follow through culturally, internally. And Intellex is focused on building the tools and having the tools available and working and partnering with you to ensure that not only are you getting the software for the goal of reducing a lot of the inefficiencies in your program, gaining visibility into your organization and the data, but to actually make sure that takes into effect and gains traction within your organization. So that's super, super important as well. Um, so what I'm going to do is now hand it over to Angelica Loriano, and she's going to talk about specifically how the Intellex solution maps to a lot of the different things that you may be looking for in a food safety management software. Thanks, Sandra. Hi, everyone. I'm Angelica Loriano, and I'm one of the senior account executives in the food and beverage uh, vertical for Intellex technology. Thanks again. 
for your time today. So yeah, now I'd like to uh, walk you through in a little more detail the benefits of our web-based quality management system so you can actually see what our software looks like. One of the biggest advantages to the NLX QMS is our mobile app like Sondra and touched upon. So as you can see here, the mobile app is intuitive, it's easy to use, it has very large buttons, it guides you and your end users to uh, the correct input forms. You can quickly and easily capture that information that you're looking for. Uh, the mobile app, in addition to the mobile app, excuse me, here is what it looks like from our web browser. So again, it's an easy to use point and click interface that's very intuitive. It's an example of conducting an audit there or an inspection. And we can take a look at what it looks like directly from a handheld device such as a mobile phone. Here's an example of what that looks like on the mobile app. So not only can you capture your findings tied to an audit or inspection, you can also attach pictures directly from your mobile device's camera, which is super easy. And as you can see, again, both options are intuitive, easy to use, which is gonna promote that buy-in from your end users so that you're actually getting the information that you need to make these uh, decisions to continuously improve. So once you and your end users uh, start collecting data through either the mobile app or the web browser, the system will actually automatically aggregate the data for you. So gone are the days of manual data manipulation. Uh, with our reporting and dashboarding engine, you're gonna be able to slice and dice your data in an infinite number of ways so that you can identify areas for improvement. You're also gonna be able to drill down into the details of the summary data just by clicking on the dashboard indicator. So this here on your screen is an example of audit findings by criticality. Another option is to view findings by clause or standard. And remember, these indicators aggregate data across your organization. So you're gonna be able to view all the locations you're responsible for. If you just wanna look at a handful of your locations or even just one location, this information is gonna be at your fingertips. Another option is to create a dashboard to show multiple metrics in one view like you see here, so you can quickly see where your organization stands in real time. You're also going to be able to pull in metrics from different applications. Uh, I know both Nicole and Sandra talked about seeing correlations between different items uh, for food safety, so things like being able to view risk connects to open action items as an example. This next slide here uh, is showing us yet another example of the different metrics you can view once you're starting to capture the information, which is nonconformances. So you can view nonconformances by type, by location, by severity. And again, if you want to drill down into the details, uh, you can do so to get that, that information that you're looking for. So basically, there are no limits to the number of dashboards you can create. So here's another example. You're going to be able to create things like a corporate dashboard that pulls in metrics from all areas of your QMS, again, for a holistic view of your food safety and quality management program. And if you're using our tools to capture things like employee health and safety and maybe supplier compliance, you're going to be able to view metrics uh, next to your food safety metrics as well. So to wrap up, this next slide here shows uh, some information about us here at NLX. So we've been changing business for good since 1992 for hundreds and hundreds of large enterprises, and many of them are in the food and beverage vertical. So we definitely have the experience and knowledge base to help you and your organization implement a world-class QMS. But don't just take our word for it. Uh, this, this slide here shows some of our awards and accolades that we've received over time. Uh, for more information on these awards, you can visit our website, nlx.com, for more information. Or, of course, you're always welcome to contact any of us at Intellects directly, so myself, Angelica, Sandra, and or Nicole. Um, and now that we have gone through our presentation, we're going to go ahead and open it up to answer some of those questions that have come in from today's presentation. Thanks. Uh, and um, we, we have time for a few questions. Here. Uh, somebody had a, 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 actually wants to see the FMEA screen. Uh, they may have a question on that. So um, uh, maybe uh, uh, who's in control? Sandra, and if you want to yes. go back to the FMEA screen, that'd be great. Uh, while you're doing that, um, Nicole, I had a question about blockchain. 
Um, so is that something, is blockchain technology something that is going to be built in to QMS software in the future, uh, do, do you believe, or is, is that something that's happening right now? So uh, over the past year and a half to two years, the focus really has been on developing prototypes that demonstrate where the value is. And, and that's, why, um, that's why I'm excited about the, the work that's been done by IBM and the, the um, Linux Foundation using Hyperledger, the, the building of the, the first prototype for this food trust. Um, I do think that over the next five years, we will start seeing uh, blockchain implementations for audit traceability within our QMS. But the thing is, is that, you know, for, for a lot of problems that we have to solve, it's kind of like a, a, a like a, I don't know, a sledgehammer for a problem that only requires like a little tap. So we're, we're evaluating right now the degree um, to which that can and should be incorporated into systems. I think the number one place where the, the value is there and it is showing is in these uh, supply chain networks where we can work on traceability between different participants in our supply chain ecosystem. Okay. And uh, Sandra, I think you accidentally stopped your share there. Yeah, I'm just uh, looking for oh, you're, that. You're searching. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, again, Nicole, um, can you describe to me then the, the, the connection, I'm still trying to draw the connection between a few of these things here, between GFSI and how that connects to an integrated software system. Uh, this is just kind of for, for me to get my head around it. So an integrated software system would help support your implementation of GF, GFSI, is that, do I have that right? Okay, so GFSI is an organization, it's an international organization, and their purpose is to make sure that there's harmonization between the different national standards. So they want to make sure that if, if your organization certifies to one, that you'll be recognized in another country, and that's really helpful for facilities that have an international presence. So they're an organization, they're a benchmarking organization. Okay. Um, the, the software systems are in place to meet the requirements of different GFSI recognized schemes. So all of the different software modules that we talk about satisfy one or more of the requirements in those, within those GFSI recognized schemes. Um, why this is so significant today and why organizations should, should really start um, raising their awareness about the integrated EHSQ systems is because FISMA is raising the bar in the U.S., and because FISMA is asking that we get uh, more risk-based and more science-based in our controls and records, um, that means that, that we're going to need to pay more attention to how we collect that data and how we use it and how we look for relationships. FISMA is challenging us to make that happen. But like I also mentioned, you know, this is a, this is a long, slow, rolling process. So we're only, we're only halfway through implementation of, of requirements that have come across because of FISMA signed into law in 2011. Um, and so this is just a, a one piece of a, a slowly evolving puzzle to get us to where we have that instant traceability, uh, you know, instant information at our fingertips where we can make those risk-based, science-based decisions. Okay. Uh, one of the attendees wants to know if anyone is using design FMEA to design food products. That's a really good question, and I would like to look into that. So if you email me or LinkedIn friend me um, and remind me that you asked that question, I'll post it in a blog post or something. That's a fantastic question. Yeah, uh, no problem. And yeah, you'll get. Um, I'll have that. I'll have that for you. Um, I, I can get that for you after the show. Um, what I do know is that that based on the research, you know, very relatively few organizations have used FMEA in practice, and what I'm seeing is that more have decided to 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 try it, to work with it, because of this shift to the preventive controls approach, because they, they want a tool to help them reveal some more of those preventive controls, and uh, it, it's, it's, you know, promising in that regard. Okay. Um, you know, we are, at the, uh, we are at the end of our time. Um, I don't see any new questions come in, but I'll tell you what, uh, for the uh, 
Uh, for those who are still formulating your questions, I'll leave the webinar open for a little bit. Continue to send your questions to us, and um, I'll just collect them and get them to the folks at Intellects here uh, offline uh, so that they can, they can get back to you separately uh, because we are, we are out of time here. Um, so uh, thanks, guys. I mean, uh, that was, uh, Nicole, that was probably the best explanation of blockchain I think I have heard yet. That actually brings me a little bit closer, marginally, to understanding what it is. So thanks, thanks for that. I'm glad to that. hear that. that really yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was good. And, it really uh, was great. <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic. Uh, and Sandra and, and um, Angelica also thanks, uh, thanks for telling us a little bit more about the Intellect product and uh, what, we, what we can expect to see on that. Um, Thanks to all of you out there as well for joining us. Uh, we, I did get a question, uh, you know, are we going to get a link to the recording and, the, you know, slides and so forth? The answer is yes. You will be getting an email with a link to the recording and, uh, uh, and a PDF of the slides as well within a day, uh, usually within about 24 hours. So take, uh, take a look at, uh, for that in, uh, about a day from now. It'll, it'll come in your email. So uh, you'll have that for yourself. And I, I, like I said, I will send any further questions on to the folks here at Intellects. So once again, from all of us here at Quality Digest and Intellects, uh, have a great day, and we will see you at the next webinar. So long.